Hello again, this is Marcy and I will be your teacher this afternoon. We're almost ready to start. Um, it is almost two o'clock here in Vancouver. So a big thank you to those of you who have been writing in and telling me why you're here today. I see that we have people in Ottawa, in Mississauga, Vancouver. Uh, I'm not sure what other cities you're from. I am talking to you from White Rock today and White Rock is south of Vancouver, just near the American border. I'm working from my home office. And, oh, I've heard from Gabrielle Guy that he is in Quebec City today. Also, someone from Brandon, which I believe is in, is that in, Winnip in Manitoba? That's right, Tina, thanks. All right, I just want to clear up a couple of things. Some of you have been writing to me about taking the original Kale paper-based test. So let me clarify, this workshop today is about the Kale CE. That's the computer edition of the test. So when I'm talking about format and scoring and so on, all of that relates to the Kale CE. However, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at writing samples and discussing what's wrong with them and fixing them. That is useful for anybody who's preparing for any type of writing test. So if uh, you want to stay, you may find that useful. Okay. So, a couple of housekeeping items. First, my formal introduction to you. My name is Marcy Laufer. I have been associated with Paragon Testing and uh, the Kale Test for years now. So, um, I, I do hope I will be able to assist you to get ready. Um, in terms of communication, you do not have microphone ability in the GoToWebinar program, so your communication with me has to happen in writing. The way to do that, and I think most of you know already, is to click on that orange arrow. This opens up your Go-To control panel. You can then click on the questions box and use that to type to me. So you can use it to ask me questions, answer my questions, make comments, just um, feel free to use it as much as you like. Now, now that I'm talking, I won't have time to stop talking and write to any of you, but what I will do is watch the questions box for your input, and I will pause regularly to read out your questions or concerns or comments and respond to them when I can. All right, so let's get started. Um, welcome to the KLCE Writing Workshop. This session should run about 60 to 75 minutes, and that depends in part on you. It depends how much each of you participates, all right? So I've already talked about how you can participate. I should also mention you may want to keep some paper and a pen or a pencil handy for making notes notes. In addition, be aware that you will be receiving a study pack after the session today by email along with um, a link to a survey. So please complete the survey and also access the study materials that were that we'll be sending you. Those will include our checklist and a summary of writing skills and strategies to help you review what you learned today. So I'm going to start with an overview of the test. I'll keep that short and sweet. Then we'll look more specifically at writing and where the writing tasks are. I'm going to spend quite a while looking at the long writing task with you, as well as the short writing task, which will come second. And for each of those, I will be sharing a sample response with you, and we you will have an opportunity to discuss different aspects of the response with me. I'll summarize with um, a, a list of skills and strategies for writing and then before we finish up I'll make sure that you're aware of the study materials that are available. 
So if you don't already know, CAEL stands for the Canadian Academic English Language Assessment and CE denotes computer edition. The computer edition of CAEL is uh, very new. It was just released last fall and it represents all of the latest understanding and research on language assessment. So it's a state of the art brand new testing tool. All right, I like everybody who comes to these workshops to understand what's going to happen on test day so that you don't have any surprises. So I have a few pictures here to share with you. You can see the test center at our head office in Vancouver on the right. If any of you are in the Toronto area, we have a similar, actually two similar test centers at our Toronto office as well. Um, on the left side, you can see what your work area might look like. Keep in mind that at our Paragon offices, we have state-of-the-art equipment, so we do use these really nice dividers between the computers. In some of the other test centers, you may have just a more basic um, box around your computer rather than around your whole body. Um, now, whatever kind of divider you have, it will help to block out the noise of the people around you. And of course, you'll be wearing a headset like this test taker here. So you will be able to see her as well. Oh, Melanie, you're not seeing the screen. Is anybody else seeing the test center screen? I sure hope that you are. You should be seeing it. Can someone let me know? Good. So you should be seeing a slide that says test center. Uh, Melanie, if you're not seeing that, I suggest that you exit the session and come back in using a different browser. That usually solves the problem. All right, so I was explaining that on test day, you will be in a test center, something like this, and you will be wearing a headset. So the headset is necessary throughout the test because you're listening and speaking, and it also helps to block out the sounds of the people around you. But do be aware that you will be able to hear voices and you will be aware of the people around you. So you need to prepare yourself for that and uh, make sure that you don't let it disturb you, okay? There's nothing we can do about the other people in the test center, but if you are expecting it ahead of time, you should be able to manage it. Sometimes you may hear the other test takers, so just try to block it out. All right, so now let's look at the format of the test. You can see here that the test is divided into five parts. And while part one is speaking only, all the other parts of the test are integrated. And that's one of the things that is different about the CAEL CE compared to the original CAEL. It's also a very big difference when you compare IELTS to CAEL uh, because IELTS is not integrated. When we say that a test is integrated, we mean that the speaking and the writing tasks that you are going to be doing will relate to the reading and listening things that you already did. So you will learn things through reading and listening, which you will be able to use in your speaking and writing responses. Now, you can see that your writing tasks come in the last two parts of the test. And uh, also at the bottom, note that there are four different topics in every test. So each of the topics is taken from a very broad faculty, either arts or science. And you can see that there is quite a wide range of subjects in each of the faculties. Uh, Alma's asking if there is a recording of the session available. I believe they are available on our YouTube channel. Um, you can check the KL, just Google KLCE YouTube, and hopefully you will be able to access a recording as well. 
Okay, so here's a more of a close-up of how the test is organized. So you can see that in each part of the test, there are going to be at least three different tasks. If you look at parts two and three, you can see that each of these parts integrates two skills. So part two has a speaking question related to some reading passages. And in part three, the speaking question relates to some listening passages. But we don't need to worry about that today because we're focused on writing. So you can see that in parts four and five, each of the writing responses relates to a reading passage and a listening passage. So when you get your writing question, the topic will be familiar to you through the work you already did, because for that reading passage, you'll have at least 11 questions, and you so you will have already read the passage and answered the question. And for the lecture, you also will have answered at least 11 questions. Both of those things will be on the same topic, and then you'll get a writing question on the same uh, topic. And then um, in the in part five, the writing response that you're doing here is a short one. Um, Kim is asking, is the text in the test original? Yes, all of the texts are written specifically for the test, but note, it, note that the texts and the lectures are modeled on standard first year uh, reading passages and lectures that you would hear or read in Canadian universities. So they're at that level of a first year post-secondary course. Okay, so you're looking now at the band or the scoring structure for KLCE, which is the same as the scoring for the original KLCE. So there are 10 bands. Please know that most Canadian colleges and universities ask for a band 70. However, you really need to check with the faculty or department of the school you want to get into and find out what score do they need. Some might accept a 60, others, however, ask for an 80. So uh, be uh, well prepared to do the work you need to get the score that you have to have. Okay, let's focus in on writing now. So you've already seen this chart and you know that you've got a long writing task in part four and a short writing task in part five. And you also know that to answer or to write those writing responses, you need to use information from the reading and the lecture, or sometimes you choose the reading or the lecture. Okay, so let's look at how these two writing tasks are different. So the long writing task comes first in part four. In terms of a word count, we don't give you a word range. Instead, we give you a minimum word count. So you, for the long writing, you have to write at least 250 words, but you can write as much as you like. You're going to have 35 minutes, so you actually have time to write a lot. However, you don't have to write more than 250 words. What I think you should focus on is making sure that whatever you write is a little, uh, you take some time at the end to work on it and improve it. So leave a little time at the end to edit your work. And um, you decide, well, how many main points should I have and how much should I develop each point? So you need to demonstrate that you know how many points you should develop to give a complete answer and how to include supporting information to do that. Now, for the long writing, as I've already stated, this will include information from the reading passage, which will be similar to a textbook excerpt and a lecture. So you're going to have to use information from the reading and the lecture in your response and it will be very much like an essay. 
For the short writing task, this one is the very last thing you do in the whole test. You're going to have to write at least 100 words, and you will have 10 minutes for this response. So it's unlikely that you're going to want to write a whole lot or that you're going to want to make a lot of points while you're writing this short response. Remember, making a lot of points isn't necessarily the right thing to do what, for either the short or the long writing. What you want to do is include enough points, but develop them well, like um, give good support for each point. So in the long writing, you probably want to have at least three main points. And in the short writing, well, it really depends what you're doing. This is going to be similar to a summary or a comprehension question or something along those lines. So it might not be how many points you make, but how many pieces of information you need to include. And the short writing will relate to the reading or the lecture. And they, I hope I'm saying that right, is asking, can we go back to the reading passage while you're on the long writing? Absolutely, and I'll show you exactly how you can do that very soon. Same with the um, short writing, you can also go back to the reading. Dina is asking, is the IELTS very different? from Kale? And the answer is yes, because first of all, IELTS is a paper test. Secondly, it is not integrated. So when you are doing your writing, you are not drawing information from a reading or a lecture. So in that way, it could actually be harder because you have to come up with your own information. Sorry, I just had to have a sip of tea. Okay. So let's look at the long writing task. Each Kale task has two screens, or at least the writing and the speaking tasks do. Now, you're looking at the first screen now, and this will give you general instructions. It also provides you with an opportunity to get ready for the task, gather your energy, make sure you're ready to start working, because as soon as you click that next button, your time begins to count down. You have 35 minutes, so it's not too critical here, but you want to be sure that as soon as you go to this page, you're ready to start doing the work. Okay, so you can see that the long writing task does a few things here. So somebody asked me, can I go back to look at the reading? And you can see we've animated the page page for you here. It's going awfully quickly. But just so you can see that when you click on each page, you get to look or focus on either the instructions, the reading, or the lecture notes. In the top right, you can see your countdown timer working. Now, on the bottom right, notice how as you type, your word count goes up. I'm just going to move off of that page because I was starting to get a little bit seasick. Um, now, Daniel's asking me, can you wait at this page, at this instructions page? Yes, this is where you are for the 35 minutes, okay? And then it's up to you to click these tabs whenever you want to, to go back to the reading or to look at the lecture notes. So when you click on the reading passage, you'll see this. And when you click on the lecture notes, you'll see this. And as you type, your word count will go up and down. So um, have a look at the question. And you can see that the question is quite complex. And that's because you are writing an essay. So when you look at the question, you need to be aware of all the parts of the question and clarify to yourself, well, what exactly do I have to do? I also want to uh, point out the um, editing tools here. So you, you can use any of these tools whenever you want. Bold, italic, underline, cut, copy, paste, undo, and redo. You don't have to use any of them. You won't get more marks for using the editing tools. You really don't need to use them if you don't want to. However, if you're comfortable with them, you're welcome to use them.
Daniel saying, can you look at this in this page here, Daniel, before, oh, you mean this page. You're asking, can you stay here as long as you want? Well, you can stay here for a short time. I'm not sure how long it is, but after a, a time, the test will automatically move you to the next page. If you are ready to move ahead to the actual question before it gets there, then you can use the next button to do that. Uh, Nagwa is asking me, what is better to use in the test, the passage or the notes? Well, you don't actually have a choice because the instructions tell you to use the reading and lecture. So you need to use information from both of them. Okay. I hope that's clear. All right. Now, you can't go back and listen to the lecture again. But you will have this summary of your lecture notes, which will include all of the main points from the lecture. And that should help you remember any information that you think will be useful, OK? All right, so how is your, your response going to be scored? So first, if we go back to the question, so you get all of these instructions on the left. So before we look at the checklist, I just want to review this with you. So you're told to use the reading and lecture notes by um, clicking on the tabs. Now, you're also told support your answer with details and examples from the source material. So you are expected to use information from the reading and lecture. Furthermore, if you look at this point, do not copy directly from the source. That means when you use information, you need to put it into your own words. This is to demonstrate the, um, the, you know, the vocabulary range that you have. OK, and finally, you're told how you will be evaluated. So there's three points, the content and structure of your response, the accuracy of your language and your use of the source material. So where was I? I was here at the checklist. OK, so in the checklist, uh, you can see that we have three main categories. So if we look at the assessment points on your instructions page, the content is covered here. Um, the structure is covered in organization. Accuracy of your language is in language use. And your use of the source material is these last four points under content, OK? So this checklist will be in your study package that you'll get later today. It's an excellent tool to help you prepare for the test. I'm not going to go through it in detail now, but we will certainly come back to it later when we look at a sample. And here is our sample, OK? So this is an essay that we've created for you to demonstrate some of the most common mistakes that test takers make. Together, you and I are going to identify and fix those mistakes. Um, now, I'm going to assume that you're not familiar with the reading and the lecture. By the way, this comes from the free sample test on our website. How many of you have done the free sample test? Because if you have, you'll be familiar with the question and as well as the sources. So let's go back and look at the question before uh, we get into the response. The question says, should scientists go back and reanalyze established conclusions and facts? Should we spend time on new questions and new research instead? Explain your position, build an argument, and provide support. So you have two parts to the question and then very explicit instructions. Explain what you think, then prove why you think that's right, and include support from the sources in that proof, right? So nobody has written in to say that they have done the free sample test. Um, is that true? Nobody out there has done it? Well, that's fine if you haven't. Now, 
uh, what I want you to do is to have a look at this sample. I'm going to give you about 45 seconds and just skim it quickly. What problems do you see and what does the test taker do well? Okay, so I'm going to be quiet for a short time while you look at that. Well, I know you probably didn't have time to read it all carefully, but um, let me start at the beginning. Remember that your response should be at least 250 words. So I'm sure nobody took the time to count, but I will tell you that this essay is only 207 words. So right away, there's a problem. It's too short. And that means it probably isn't long enough to, full, to provide a fully developed response. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the essay from the beginning. We're going to see what else is wrong with it, fix those problems, and then I'll come back to the word count at the end. All right. Does anybody want to volunteer anything they've noticed about this essay? Strengths or weaknesses? Well, I'm going to start. Oh, Daniel has jumped in to say it has a very vague introduction. And uh, Daniel, I think you remember that from uh, if you did this workshop before, right? Thank you. You're absolutely right. So basically, there isn't an introductory statement. The, this writer has jumped right into his first point. So it's best in an essay to start with some kind of introductory statement. It could be background information about the topic. It could be a statement of opinion. Uh, it could be a hook of some kind. So we need to be able to rework the beginning. Now, if you're not familiar with the reading or the lecture, it's very hard for you to do that. So I have prepared an introductory statement for you. All right. So if we read it, is everything in our history books accurate, factual and true? When we consider the facts around how mankind recorded early history, such as who was writing it down and why they were doing so, this assumption becomes questionable. So we now have a much more interesting opening to the essay. We are starting with a question and a question can function as a hook. A hook is something you write that reaches out and says to the reader, hey, I have something interesting to say. You better keep reading me because you're going to learn a lot. Right. So by asking a question at the beginning, you can um, write a good hook. Now, you don't have to have a question at the beginning. You can just give some background information. Kim's asking, do we have to provide a hook? If I don't have a hook, will my mark be affected? Good question. A, a hook is not a critical element. It isn't going to to lose you marks if you don't write a hook. However, if you're aiming for a very, very high score, including a, a good hook appropriately could raise your mark. But what you do want to provide is some kind of background information or opening statement. So let's say you skipped the first sentence and started with the second one, um, then that might be um, effective, although you would have to replace this assumption with what you said in the first sentence. Okay, I hope that's that helps you, Kim. 
Oops. So I wanted to say, um, so you'll see that whatever is in blue is what we have fixed and whatever you see in red is a problem. So let's look more closely at the sentence that was the first sentence at the beginning. There are problems in this sentence. Can you figure out what they are? Don't be shy. Just jump in and make a guess. Okay, well, I will help you out. So, what I suggest is that um, this phrase, a wrong idea, is not quite appropriate for an essay. The reason is it's judgmental. So, the tone isn't appropriate because in an essay, we should, um, we should be very factual and unemotional most of the time. So when we make a judgment statement like this, it isn't uh, appropriate in an essay, okay? So even worse, this phrase has been repeated. So you want to try to avoid repeating key phrases and you especially want to avoid repeating phrases that aren't appropriate to begin with. And Nagawa is pointing out we should be more specific. So that's also a good point. Um, and Kim has noticed some spelling problems, and there are some spelling problems, but not in this sentence. Okay, so does anybody have suggestions for a way to restate this idea, a wrong idea? How can we rephrase that in an impartial way? Let's see. I'm just reading a long statement from Gabrielle. He says um, he should present both of his arguments that he will explain more in detail in the following paragraphs. Also, is this statement so many basic to our understanding of the world isn't a valuable phrase? I'm not sure where that is. Oh, they are so basic to our understanding of the world. Well, yeah, right now, because he says they, uh, we've had a lot of vague statements before he gets to they, and that makes it un not valuable. You're absolutely right, Gabriel. So we're going to fix these problems, okay? Kim is noticing that the ideas are biased and subjective. Excellent comment. So let's start by fixing this phrase, wrong idea. So I have replaced it with a flawed perception. Okay, so that isn't judgmental because we're not using the word wrong. Nobody likes it when we say, hey, you're wrong. Instead, we're simply saying in a very unbiased way, this seems to be a flawed perception. Okay, so if we go to the next four sentences, they have something in common. Can you see what it is? Something that we need to fix. Good, Kim. They are all short sentences. You're right. There are other problems too. We still have this second repeat of wrong ideas, right? And um, somebody mentioned spelling mistakes. There are a few spelling mistakes. I hope you can find them. And what about this last sentence here? This is why. What do we learn from this sentence? Nothing. It's totally uninformative. So let's start with the easy stuff, the spelling sentence, the spelling uh, mistakes. So they are, um, so traditionally was spelled wrong. Oh, I think there was just this one mistake. There was only one L before. So we've now corrected the spelling mistake. What about going back to correct this wrong ideas? Um, and then Julie is wondering about the usage of we should. It isn't wrong to say we should. Um, it's it's um, 
a good way of replacing I think. And some people don't like to see I think in an essay. Actually, it's not such a problem to say I think or we should. These are kind of polite ways of offering an opinion. Oh, you're right. It is repetitive to have we should repeated it in three sentences. It's used twice. Absolutely. And that's going to be fixed. Remember that these four short sentences are a real problem. So we're going to fix that. But first, let's fix this wrong idea. So here we're replacing it with false assumptions. Oh, Nagawa had suggested ambiguous assumptions. Equally good. Thank you for that, Nagawa. I wish I had thought of that. Um, yes, Nagawa, exactly. I was saying Nagawa, right? I apologize. Okay, so now we have fixed the bigger, no, we have fixed a few little problems, but we have the big problem of the four sentences. Watch this. Okay, so here's what we're suggesting. Take those three sentences and combine them using a parenthetical phrase. That's the phrase between the dashes. To avoid maintaining these false assumptions, many of which may be fundamental to our understanding of the world, we would be wise to reassess traditionally accepted facts. So we've now combined three sentences into one and it's much more smooth or it's much smoother, I should say. So now this final sentence is hanging at the end of a paragraph. It's a really weak way to end the paragraph and it really doesn't lead very well into the next one. So instead, I suggest this fix up here. So instead of this is why, we can say, the following examples illustrate why this is true. Now, the first paragraph ends by informing us, okay, so in the next paragraph, I'm going to get specific examples showing me why having false assumptions is such a problem. Okay, so now I'm saying something much more useful. Okay. I'm not going to make you look at the whole essay at one time. I just wanted to point out here that there's a problem with this phrase and this phrase. So they're in two different paragraphs. However, it is the same problem. It's impossible for you to know what it is without looking at the reading or the lecture. So let me show you. So this is paragraph two. The same phrase has been highlighted, okay? Oh, by the way, I just want to go back and clarify that we've now corrected all of the problems in the first paragraph. There are many, many, many different ways to correct problems, so we're just showing you one way to correct those problems, all right? So going to paragraph two, if you look at an excerpt from the reading, you should be able to quickly see what the problem here is. Anybody? Anybody want to tell me what the problem is? What do you notice when you look at the reading? Thank you, Andrea and Julie, Daniel and Gabrielle, you all have caught it. It's a direct copy from the reading. Why is this a problem? Well, if we Oh, hold on. Yeah, so this is exactly what's been copied. And what I wanted to show you is, hi, Sheila, welcome, is that the um, phrase, the reason it's a problem is you are told in several different ways not to copy directly from the reading or the lecture. Remember, it, the third point in your on your questions page clearly says, use the source information, but do not copy directly. And then this final point in the content section of the checklist says, is the writer able to restate ideas in his or her own words? So that's why this is such a problem, right? You do need to say it your own way. 
So remember there was a similar problem in the third paragraph. So I'm jumping ahead to the third paragraph now and I'm showing you an excerpt from the lecture. You will never see a transcript of the lecture during the official test. We include it here for teaching purposes only, okay? So please be aware of that. So you can see that, again, a phrase has been copied directly from a source. So these will both have to be corrected. All right, so let's return to the essay. How can we correct this first phrase? Can anyone think of a good way to rewrite this sentence in your own words? The reading passage shows why history should not be seen as fully objective. Just going to turn off my pointer. It's a problem. While I wait to hear from you. There, that's much better. Okay. So that's all right. If you're not sure how to rework it, of course, I have an idea. How about this? The reading passage convincingly shows why historical accounts are often biased. Instead of, the reading passage shows why history should not be seen as fully objective. So I've rewritten the phrase and I've added the adverb convincingly because it's it adds a nice strong flavor to the sentence okay and then if we go to so we're gonna briefly jump ahead to paragraph three to rewrite the other phrase that was copied any ideas here about how to do this one which is why it does not provide great benefits in the first generations. This is a much longer sentence, so it's a little harder. So I suggest, which is why the first few generations barely noticed any advantages. There you go, if you're just looking to see how it was rewritten. Okay, so again, there's at least a dozen ways you could rewrite this. Uh, this is just one solution to the problem. And the idea here is just to point out to you the kinds of problems that come up and give you some ideas about how to tackle fixing them. Okay, so going back to the second paragraph, we've rewritten the first sentence, which was information from the reading. And then the middle, the middle chunk of the paragraph is solid. So there's nothing we really need to do there. Feel free to take a moment to read it. But the final sentence is problematic, or something about it is problematic. So if you read the, the beginning of the paragraph and then look at the sentence in red, what is missing? Anybody? Any ideas what's missing? Well, it's okay. I can tell you, it is actually a transition. All right, so we this is a very good place to include a phrase or a word that indicates how this sentence relates to what came before it. In fact, adding a transition here raises the writing level of the sentence because it shows the ability of the writer to give the reader signposts about what's going on. Gabrielle is calling it a relationship marker, which is a, a nice term. Okay, can anyone come up with the the right one? There's more than one, but of course you need to choose a transition that's appropriate for how this sentence relates to what came before. And there are quite a few that would work here. Uh, specifically, for example, for instance, in particular. So because this red sentence is giving specific information about what came before, that's why those types of um, transitions are appropriate. So I like the way in particular fits here. So that's the one that I've chosen to add in, okay? So we've now fixed the second paragraph and we're going to move on 
and have a look at the third paragraph. Remember that we fixed this blue phrase because it had been originally just copied directly from the lecture, okay? So let's start with spelling problems. Anybody notice any spelling problems here? Don't be shy. Just jump in if you see any. Oh, thank you. So Kim has noticed tissues. Yep. Tissues is a is spelling problem as well as there's one more. Nobody has found it. However, uh, Daniel's typed in very long time and I think maybe he's saying something about that phrase and there is a problem with that that phrase. And no, disprove is actually fine, but tiny, yes, tiny is a problem. So Kim is saying issues, hold on, issues should be tissues, right? And time should be, or sorry, tiny should be time. Sorry, yeah, I think I got one of those backwards. So these are both wrong right now. Now, when I say spelling mistakes, what I mean is that, so here's the correct spelling. What I mean is that while the words you see are correctly spelled, the test taker got a little sloppy when they were typing. And while they had the right word in their mind, they actually typed the wrong word. And these kinds of spelling mistakes can be incredible confusing for the reader because the word appears to be correct but it's the wrong word and therefore the meaning of the whole sentence becomes um, unclear and that slows the reader down so you want to avoid that which is one reason to leave at least three minutes at the end of your 35 minutes to read your work and fix problems like this Okay, so going back to the first sentence, it is the same for other areas. What's wrong here? And those theories, what's wrong there? Similar problem. Yes, thank you, Julie. They're both vague. What did the test taker mean to say here? Because when you say to me, it is the same for other areas, I go, it what? Same as what? Other areas, what? Those theories, which theories? This is an example of how important it is to be specific and clear in academic writing, okay? And vague writing is the opposite of specific and clear. Okay, so, um, let me give you some suggestions. Going back here, instead of it is the same for other areas, let's get very specific. Similar thinking applies to our understanding of domestication. Well, do you see the difference? This tells us much more about what the whole paragraph will be about. So, in addition, we're adding another sentence. The lecture explains how a handful of insubstantial theories were shared in the 1800s and 1900s. Okay, so now we have a whole uh, host of information to look to use. And um, let's see. We also now know that the essay is going to is using information from the lecture to make a point. Notice also that we've added a transition. Looking back now is a high level transition, right? And this really adds sophistication and clarity to your work and it helps to raise your score. Okay, so we've made a few fixes here. What about a paragraph break? The problem right now is that this paragraph gives us a lot of information and it includes a conclusion, but wouldn't it be nice to have a nice short concluding paragraph on its own? 
where would you break up this long last paragraph to create that conclusion? Any thoughts? Oh, thank you. Julie is saying after advantages, and I would have to agree with you, right? So if we break the paragraph here, then we have a nice, strong um, content paragraph, and then we head into a fresh paragraph for our conclusion. However, what's wrong now? Look at the first sentence of this conclusion. Something wrong here. What could it be? Well, what does, if I say to you, there must be a million other examples, does that sound like um, a strong academic statement to you? It's uh, an exaggeration and it is impossible to prove. How am I going to prove to you that I have a million other examples, right? In an academic essay, you need to support everything you say with clear facts and, and details, which uh, convince the reader that what you're saying is actually correct and factual. That's the, the heart of an academic essay. Uh, I'm going to pause on that point and go to Alma's point. She says, but these errors are more academic than English, are they not? How much of this academics versus English? I'm not sure exactly what you mean with your question, Alma, but the point here is to demonstrate the kinds of mistakes you want to avoid and also to demonstrate that there is a difference between everyday English and academic English. And I keep talking about how you need to be impartial, you need to use your sources, you need to make factual statements, and you need to uh, learn how to put together a solid essay uh, that doesn't raise unanswered questions in the reader's mind, okay? So that's what I'm focused on here for you. I hope that addresses your question, Alma. Okay, so um, now I've just pointed out that this sentence, there must be a million other examples, isn't quite appropriate for an academic essay. So let's think about how to rephrase that. Any ideas how to do that? And then we'll just tidy up the ending. Kim is suggesting, as shown above, and then, Kim, are you suggesting we would then continue? As shown above, there must be a million other examples. So Kim is adding a transition. It That helps. However, um, I would suggest that to correct this problem, um, we, we want to change the tone of this sentence. There must be is very informal and a million other is an exaggeration, right? So how's about, uh, Kim is saying, as shown above through the reading and lecture, through today's reading and lecture, we learn that and so on. Okay, that's very helpful as well. And here's another approach. There are undoubtedly many more examples which illustrate how critical it is to challenge established judgments. So now the sentence has a much more uh, impartial and academic tone, and it gives much more specific information, okay? So we keep coming back kind of to the same issues. Now, what about adding a transition into this paragraph? Can you see where we could do that? Well, I would suggest right here for the last sentence, with this in mind. So this tells us, okay, keeping everything I've just said in this paragraph in mind, uh, this will help you to understand why 
okay? That's what it means when we say with this in mind. And then we end with looking backwards may actually help give us clarity as we move forward with more purpose and direction. Okay, so we've corrected a lot of problems in this essay, and you're going to get a copy of this uh, reworked essay in your study package today. Okay, so this version now, do you think it's 250 words? What do you think? It is actually 286 words, okay? So remember the original version was just 207 words. So by fixing those mistakes, clarifying ideas and adding details, we solve the, the problem of not having enough words. And that's also because we added a lot more supporting information and clarified some of our ideas, which needed more words. Now, if we return to the checklist, we can see that the revised response meets all the requirements. So if we go through every point, you'll see that the original version answers sometimes or no to most of the questions, although there are, are some yeses, and the reworked version answers yes. So does the re writer remain on topic is yes for both versions. Does the writer use specific details and examples to support ideas that was sometimes, now it's a yes. Is the writer's viewpoint clearly expressed? Again, it was a sometimes, now it's a yes. Does the writer fully answer the question? Well, before it was a no because there wasn't enough information to be convincing, and now it's a yes. Is the length sufficient? And it was a no before, but a yes now. Does the writer avoid repeating ideas? That was a sometimes, now it's a yes. Does the writer use information from the reading section to support and develop ideas? It is a yes now, and it was yes before. But for listening, it was a sometimes before, and now it's a yes, because um, there was very little information drawn from the listening in the original version, just one tiny piece. Um, is the writer able to restate ideas in his or her own words? Again, it was sometimes, now it's yes. For organization, there was no introduction before. Um, were, there were no logical transitions used, or there might have been one or two very simple ones. So it, it's either a no or a sometimes, but now it's a yes. Is the response well organized and easy to follow? I would say at least a sometimes before, but not quite a yes, but it is a yes now. Does it have appropriate paragraphing? Remember, we had that problem with the concluding paragraph. So it was a no, now it's a yes. What about language use? There were errors in spelling that impeded comprehension. So it was a sometimes, it's a yes. Oh, there it's a no now, there are no errors now. Um, do grammatical structures support meaning? You know, his grammar was pretty good before, so that was maybe a yes for both or maybe a sometimes before, I'd have to go back and look more carefully. Let me know if you have an opinion. Variety of sentence types, I would say yes. Uh, well, remember the, the writer depended a lot on those short sentences, so sometimes before and yes now. Does the writer avoid repetition by using a range of vocabulary? Remember we had that repetition before, so sometimes, but yes now. And the vocabulary and tone were not always suitable before. So it was a sometimes, it's a yes now. Uh, Kim is asking me a question. Perfect timing, Kim. That's next, yes. We still have 15 minutes, okay? Now, for short writing, I'm going to show you what the question looks like. So the instructions page is exactly the same, except for the word count and the timing. Remember, you have 10 minutes. Here's what the question looks like, and you're seeing an animation of moving back and forth and the word count. 
okay, let's just sit here on the questions page. So uh, it's very, very similar, but remember that for the short question, you are told use information from the reading or lecture. So you do not have to use both and you probably don't have time to use both. However, you might get to choose which one you want to use, okay? So you want to quickly make that decision because remember, you only have 15 minutes. If you look at the question, it's very simple compared to what we had before. Based on the reading passage, what are some features and characteristics that distinguish different planets? Okay, so that, um, otherwise everything here is the same, including how you'll be evaluated. Okay, let me know if you have questions about it. Kim is saying, but we don't have a choice to choose between the reading and the lecture. Um, I believe you may be told which one to use, but I'm not 100% certain about that. If you really want to know, Kim, call customer service and they can clarify that for you. Um, I, I will check it so that I can answer that next time. What's the strategy to write it? Well, let's have a quick look. In this case, you're being asked to give a summary, right? What are some features and characteristics that distinguish different planets? So when you're asking me, what is the strategy to write it? Because I don't have much time. I only have 10 minutes. I would say, look at the question. Ask yourself, okay, what do I need to do here? I need to summarize the features and characteristics. Okay, which are the paragraphs that talk about that? So you want to identify the paragraphs if you're looking at the reading or identify the information in the lecture that addresses that and then just focus in on that chunk of information. It's probably going to be a couple of paragraphs at most and use that to answer the question. So you can see that the checklist is shorter because in such a short response, the, the elements of the structure aren't quite as critical, are they? You're not going to have time to write whole paragraphs and long, long, uh, long, long explanations. So in terms of content and organization, there are fewer points that you have to worry about. All right, so I have a sample response here for you. This is about a band 80, 90. Um, and by the way, when we did the long response, the original was about a 50, 60, and then the revised version was an 80, 90. Kim is asking, do we need an introduction sentence? I would say always, always. This is academic writing. In an essay, you might have a short introduction paragraph or a couple of sentences because you want to give background information and state your opinion. In a very short summary, you may just have a single sentence and you can see it right here. Planets are differentiated according to a number of features, but scientists tend to focus primarily on their makeup, location, size, and number of satellites. So this sentence introduces the topic and tells us the one, two, three, the four topics that we're going to very quickly discuss in our response, okay? So you can look at this more carefully at home later. Um, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to tell you here? Or are there any questions before we go on? Because what I'm going to do next is summarize writing skills and strategies. All right, if you have questions, let me know. In terms of the short writing, I feel that you've, uh, you already have a really good idea of what to look for in, um, uh, in terms of organization and vocabulary and the types of information you want to include. Okay, so let's look at writing skills. So as you write each response, you want to try to demonstrate your best academic English ability. And these skills are the key things that will help you to do that. So first of all, 
clearly you want to minimize any spelling, grammar, and punctuation problems. Okay, that means leave time at the end and go back and review your work and see what you can improve. Remember how important it is to include a few transitions. And the transitions should link what was in the previous paragraph to what you're about to say. And most importantly, it, it should be appropriate to how those two pieces of information are related. And you want to try to use higher level transitions. So not simple things like but, uh, but something more uh, academic, like on the other hand, or in contrast, something like that. Also try to use vocabulary that is suitable for the topic. Much of that vocabulary will be introduced in the reading and the lecture. Remember, it's okay to use key words, so words that express ideas that are specific to the topic, but what you don't want to do is copy entire phrases and sentences. When you repeat an idea of your own that you've already um, introduced, rephrase it in a different way to demonstrate your range of vocabulary. And you already know that when you're using information from the reading or the lecture, you want to rephrase it in your own way. Now, this is important. Remember to use a variety of sentence types and lengths. You don't want to have just a long string of compound complex sentences. That would be very unpleasant for the reader. So it's important to have all types of sentences in your writing and to mix them up and not have, as we saw, uh, many short sentences in a row. So simple, compound, complex, and compound complex sentences. Try to use them all. And you've also seen how important it is to use an appropriate tone and register for academic writing. So that means formal language and an impartial, non-judgmental tone. Okay? All right, now strategies can be divided into three main areas. So what you do before you start writing, what you do while you're writing, and then what you do at the end when you're reviewing your work. So let's talk about pre-writing. So for the essay especially, before you start writing, take at least two or three minutes. Use this time to think about specifically um, the things you're going to write about. Brainstorm some ideas, so, so even Jot down every idea that comes into your mind. Cross out the weak ideas and then keep those strong ideas and number them to put them into a logical order. You also want to collect information to help you support each of those ideas. And this means going back to the passage and the lecture for the long writing to find pieces of information that will help you support your points. And then um, as you're um, writing down those ideas and crossing some out and numbering others, that's one way to create to create an outline. Hopefully, for your essay, you're going to have at least three main ideas. And for each of those ideas, you'll have some specific details from your sources to develop them. In terms of the short essay, I would say, oh, so hold on, let me restate that. For the long essay, you want to take at least three minutes, maybe four minutes, to get organized and plan. For the short writing, I would say take up to a minute to absorb the question and maybe jot down the points that you want to address in your response, okay? During your writing time, Always start with an introduction statement. So for the short writing, it might be a simple sentence. For the essay, it will be a couple of sentences or a very short paragraph. Stay on topic. Clearly state your position. 
include supporting information from your sources and try to develop your response in a, a nice, smooth, and full way. Also, I should have added on here, have a concluding statement or uh, a conclusion, conclusion paragraph at the end. Okay, watch the clock. And for the long writing, leave yourself three minutes of reviewing time, two to three minutes, let's say. What I suggest you do is make sure that you have completed what you wanted to write by the time you hit um, 32 or 33 minutes on the countdown. Actually, it'll say three or two minutes, right? And then um, close your eyes for a minute rub your face. And what you want to do is kind of get out of that mindset, refresh your mind, open your eyes, and pretend that you've never, you've never seen this piece of writing before and read it from kind of from above as if you're a teacher. What do you notice in it? What can you do to make it better? Look at the spelling, grammar, punctuation, sentence structure, formatting, and polish it as well as you can. Just try to correct those sloppy mistakes because those things can lose you marks. Okay, so how can you get ready for the test? Well, one way was to take this workshop, and I hope it's been helpful for you. In addition, we have a number of practice materials available for you. So we've got, um, let's see, three so first of all, we have the sample test available for free on our website. It is a complete test. Anyone can do it. We also have three practice tests. Uh, practice test one is available for $25, but the other two are free. Just go to the website and get the code. There is a fourth practice test coming out in one or two weeks. Um, each of these tests includes a uh, let's see, an answer key, as well as explanations for all of the answers that will help you understand why it's right or wrong. We also have our ebook called KLCE, an overview. This is a free ebook that's kind of like a basic study guide, very useful to get familiar with the format of the test and what it's all about. And then we also have the Academic Vocabulary Builder, which is a self-study online, it's an online self-study tool. And it's kind of fun. It has worksheets and quizzes and, and all kinds of activities. So I've already talked about what's in the practice test. I don't think I mentioned this third point, the speaking portions include a record and playback feature so you can go back after your practice is done and listen to your response and your writing will also be saved so use our um, writing checklist to review your work. Uh, I've talked about the overview, which includes, let's see, some insights on scoring, test strategies, study tips, and most importantly, it is free. And here's the vocabulary builder, okay? Oh, there's also flashcards, puzzles, and lists, and you can use it on your tablet and phone. Okay, so getting ready to wrap up for today, I think I've already mentioned that you can get practice tests two and three for free until July 2nd using the codes available on our bookstore page. Um, when you get our email later today, there will be a link to a survey. If you complete that survey, you'll get a code that gives you access to practice test one for free. So in other words, you can get all our practice tests at no charge. Um, also, I hope you're aware that uh, the test price is discounted for all of this year. So it's just $225, but it will go up in 2019. And I believe it will be $265 at that time. And finally, if you are eligible for the pre-test that we're doing in certain locations across the country. It's free, but you have to meet certain criteria. And once you've done it, you'll get 50% off the official test price.
Okay, so uh, don't forget to follow us uh, on social media in any of these ways or all of these ways. And I want to thank you for your participation today. I am available for a few minutes and more than happy to answer questions or address concerns if you have any. So um, if there are any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will close down in a minute. So I will just sit quietly and wait. Although I will say that if you do have a test coming up soon, I wish you all the best of luck. And I do strongly recommend that you go through the sample test and be as prepared as possible. Uh, Melanie is asking, is the kale similar to cell pip general? Um, it's quite different. Now, the similarity is that they are both, um, they are both ebook, sorry, I'm reading the next question. They're both computer delivered, so that's how they're similar. Now, the kale is a test of academic English, and it's an integrated test. So you use the reading and the listening to do the speaking and writing, whereas the cell pip is a test of functional everyday English, and each of the skills is separate. Okay, that's how they're different. Negar wants to know the name of the ebooks, and we have this one. No, that's not an ebook. The ebook is just this one KLCE, an overview. And the practice tests are not ebooks, those are platforms or applications. And then we also have the self-study program, Academic Vocabulary Builder. Gabrielle is asking me about uh, the small writing task. He says, I'm probably sure that the questions would be demonstrate the similarities and differences in the given text. Um, the similarities and differences of what? I'm not quite sure what you mean, but um, Oh, yeah. Uh, well, there are many different questions, Gabrielle. If you are asked to uh, talk about similarities and differences, then yes, it would make sense to do uh, first all the similarities and then all the differences. Yeah, to get the 50% discount, you would need to take the pretest. That's the last item here, but not everyone is eligible. You have to be between the ages of 18 and 25, and I believe you also have to have done the IELTS test within a certain period of time. I'm not quite clear, but just go to this website and it will tell you exactly what the requirements are. This is um, um, just a great way to get extra practice if you're eligible. Okay, Julie, you are more than welcome and thank you for participating in the workshop and making it better. I appreciate that. Daniel wants to know, is IELTS easier than KL? It depends on you. Every test is hard in its own way, right? And every test is comfortable for some people and not for others. IELTS is a paper test. KL CE is a computer test. IELTS is um, not integrated, right? Um, is it okay if you write f more than 250 words? Absolutely, you can write as much as you want for the long response, but as I said, writing a whole lot isn't necessarily as good as writing less and writing it really well. Any final questions? Yes, Negar has pointed out kale. So the paper version of the kale is available till August of this year. Yes, and then it will be retired because it is old and tired. And that's why we created the kale CE. It's much a much more modern test. Yep, so if you want to do the kale paper, do it before August. Gabrielle wants to know how long before you get your mark once you do the exam, and I believe it is eight business days. Again, you may want to double check that. It's, I'm sure it's on our um, webpage as well. 
Okay, well, I hope this has been helpful. And I do want to wish you good luck. And when you go in on test day, just make sure you're ready so you can walk in feeling calm and confident, right? That's the key. Don't drink a lot before the test. It is, uh, and I don't mean alcohol, of course. I mean any liquids. It's a three and a half hour test. So uh, try to make sure you don't have to uh, run off to the bathroom during the test if you can avoid it, okay? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, uh, Nagwa is asking me who accepts KLCE. Check our website, but I can tell you there are over 190 colleges and universities which accept it. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. And once we get to it, have a great weekend. Best of luck to you on the test and best of luck with your academic goals. Bye-bye.